In this video, we discuss recursion, how it can be used and how it compares to an iterative approach. It's important you've got a solid understanding of the basic programming concepts and different data types before you watch these videos. We covered those in SLR playlist 8 and 13. Although you could learn the theory independently, it makes much more sense if you're able to work through these videos and their examples by implementing their concepts in real program code. These videos are therefore designed to reinforce and consolidate the understanding of programming techniques you will need for the exam, rather than teach you these concepts from scratch. Remember, the way to become a good programmer is by programming, little and often. You don't become a good programmer simply by watching videos and studying theory. So let's start with the obvious question. What is recursion? Well, recursion is when a subroutine, often a function, calls itself within its own subroutine. A recursive subroutine should exhibit these three characteristics. It should contain a stopping condition, sometimes known as a base case. Second, for any input value other than the stopping condition, the subroutine should call itself. This is the act of recursion. And finally, the stopping condition should be reachable within a finite number of times. Without these characteristics, a recursive subroutine may call itself indefinitely, resulting in a stack overflow. And you'll see what we mean by this later on. So to fully examine the concept of recursion, let's write some code that produces the factorial of a number supplied by a user. So the factorial of a non-negative integer n is the product of all positive integers less than or equal to n. In mathematics, we denote this as n explanation mark. So for example, 3 factorial would be 3 times 2 times 1 equals 6, and so on and so forth. OK, as this problem will perform the same operation, that's a multiplication again and again to produce an answer, your first thought might be to use an iteration construct. And we've written a function here for producing the factor of an integer using iteration, and it's on the screen. Here we can see a function called factor underscore it. It's taking a single integer n as a parameter. Let's imagine the users called this function and passed it the value 3. We start by declaring two variables, counter and answer, both are currently null. We then initialize both these variables to one. We now enter a for loop and we say for counter equals one to n. So n is three, so this loop will execute three times. There's a single line of code inside the for loop. Answer equals the current answer times counter. So that means currently answer will equals one times one. We've reached the next statement, which causes the counter increment to two. Back inside the for loop, the single line of code executes again, answer equals answer times counter. So now answer equals one times two. We reach the next statement again, so counter increments to three. Back inside the for loop, we run the single line of code. Now we've got answer equals two times three. We hit the next statement, which increments the counter to four. This means when we check the condition for entering the for loop, they're no longer being met. We skip past the for loop to the function's return statement, which then outputs the value currently held in the variable answer, which is six, and the function ends. We successfully calculated the factorial of three using an iterative approach, in this case a for loop. Now, here's the function rewritten using recursion. The first thing to notice is there are fewer lines of code. Remember, this code performs exactly the same functions before, except now it's going to use recursion instead of iteration. 
As before, we have a function, this time called factor underscore rec, which takes a single integer n as a parameter. So let's call this function, again passing it in the initial value of 3. We start with an if statement, if n equals 0. Well, n doesn't equal 0, it equals 3, the value that was passed in when the function was called. So we jump to the else section of the if statement. At this point, we hit an interesting line of code. We've got factorial rec equals n times factorial rec, open brackets, n minus 1, close brackets. Now, this is where the magic happens. The return value of factor underscore rec is going to become equal to n multiplied by the value returned from a brand new call to the function factor rec, but this time passing in n minus 1. The function has just recursively called itself. The original copy of the function is paused and we're now executing a new copy of it. Now, don't worry if you're finding this a little confusing at the moment. We're going to step through it so you really get to understand what's going on. So this is a valid recursive function as it meets all three of the conditions we outlined at the start of the video. It contains what we call a stopping condition, a base case, a terminating condition. And it's here. It's when n equals zero. For any input value other than the stopping condition, the subroutine should call itself recursively. And indeed, it does in the else part. And the stopping condition should be reachable within a finite number of times. Well, it is, and we'll prove that to you. So let's work through this recursive function in detail so you fully understand how it works. So here's the entire program. This time we've included an extra subroutine called main, and that's going to be responsible for passing in the integer value 4, and then it's going to output the result of calling factor rec with the value 4. So it should end up outputting to the screen 24, which is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. On the right is an abstraction of the stacks in memory. We're going to use this to keep track of two important details. The first column is going to hold the contents of the variable n, and the second column keeps track of which line of code to return to as the algorithm recursively calls itself and then starts to unwind. Currently, the stacks are both empty. The program starts at line 9 and proceeds to line 10. Here, we call factor underscore rec and we pass in the value 4. We now jump to line 1 of that function um, and at the same time, we push the value 4 onto the n stack to show that the variable n has taken on this initial value. We push 10 onto the call stack as that's the line of the program we'll need to return to when this current function exits. We hit an if statement if n equals 0. Well n is not equal to 0 so we skip to the else section on line 5. We hit a recursive call that calls the factor rec function again, this time passing in the value of n minus 1, which is going to be 3. We're now executing a brand new copy of the function factor rec. We've passed in the value 3 and pushed it onto the stack. Once this new copy of the function exits, we'll need to return to the original copy so we've also pushed 5 onto the call stack. We reach the if statement again if n equals 0, or n is not equal to 0, so we skip to the else section on line 5. Next, we hit another recursive function call. So once again, we call the function factorial rec and pass it the value of n minus 1. Well, n minus 1 now is currently 2. 3 minus 1 is 2. 
we're now executing another new copy of the function factorial rec. We've passed in the value 2 and pushed it onto the end stack. Once this copy of the function exits, we'll need to return to the original copy, so we've also pushed another 5 onto the call stack. We reach the if statement, if n is 0, well it's not, it's 2. So we skip to the else section and we hit yet another recursive call. Once again, we call the function factorial rec and pass in the value of n minus 1. Well, n is currently 2, so n minus 1, 2 minus 1 is 1. We're now executing yet another new copy of the function factorial rec. We've passed it in the value 1 and pushed it onto the n stack. Once this copy of the function exits, we're going to need to return to the previous copy. So we also have pushed another 5 onto the stack. We reach the if statement again if n equals 0. Well, n isn't 0, it's 1. So we skip to the else part on line 5 and we hit yet another recursive call. Once again, we simply call the function factorial rec and this time pass it n minus 1. Well, n is 1, so 1 minus 1 is 0. Okay, so we're 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 levels deep into this recursive function call. So watch what happen, happens carefully now. Finally, we have a situation where n does equal 0. We've hit the terminating or stopping condition. The stack of recursive functions will now begin to unwind. So as we've reached line 3, we have factorial underscore rec equals 1. This is the return clause of this function, and we will need to return this value to the previous copy. But how do we know to where to return to? Well, when we hit the end of a function or its return statement, we pop the values off the top of the stack. These values tell us to return to line 5 of the previous copy of the factorial rec function, passing it the value 1. And you can see we've shown that there on the screen. Having returned the previous copy of the function and passed it the return value of 1, we can finally evaluate this expression and complete the assignment statement. So we have n, which if we look at the top of the stack is 1, multiplied by 1. So 1 times 1 is 1. So factorial rec is assigned the value of 1. We've hit a return clause of this function and we also need to return this value to the previous copy. Again, as we've hit a return statement, we pop the values off the top of the stack. These values tell us to return to line 5 of the previous copy of actor rec and pass it the value 1. We're starting to unwind the stack. OK, so having returned to the previous copy of the function and passed it the return value of 1, we can finally evaluate this expression and complete its assignment statement. So we have n again, which if we look at the top of the stack is 2, multiplied by 1. Well, 2 times 1 equals 2. So factorial rec is assigned the value 2. We have hit a return clause of this function, and we also need to return this value to the previous copy. Again, as we've hit a return statement, we pop the values off the top of the stack. These values tell us to return to line 5 of the previous copy of factor rec and pass in the value 2. We are continuing to unwind the stack. Having returned to the previous copy of the function and passed it the value 2 this time, we can finally evaluate this expression and complete the assignment. So once again, we've got n, which if we look at the top of the stack is currently 3, multiplied by 2, which was returned. So 3 times 2 equals 6. So factorial rec is assigned the value 6. We've hit a return clause again, and as before, we pop the values off the top of the stack. These tell us once more to return to line 5 
of the previous copy of Factorial Rec and pass in the value 6. We continue to unwind the stack. Having returned to the previous copy of the function and passed in the return value of 6, we can once again evaluate this expression and complete the assignment statement. So we have n, which if we look at the top of the stack is currently 4, multiplied by the returned value of 6, so 4 times 6 equals 24. So factorial rec is assigned the value 24. We reach the final return clause as before, we pop the values at the top of the stack. These tell us to return to line 10 of the subroutine submain in this case and pass in the value 24. This gets written out to the screen. We have finished fully unwinding the recursive function. The stacks are now empty and we write the value 24 to the screen, which of course is the factor of 4. 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 is 24. So here are both approaches to solving the factorial problem. The first using iteration and the second using recursion. So which one do you think is more efficient in terms of memory usage? Well, in this situation, the better option is using iteration and the for loop. Recursion is actually not very memory efficient. Every time a recursive function calls itself, the processor needs to remember where it was before it jumps to the new copy so it knows to where to return to later. The processor also needs to remember the values of all the previous variables as they're local to those copies of the recursive function. And this is done using stacks which take up space in memory. Remember, if you have a recursive subroutine that calls itself too many times before reaching its terminating condition, you could run out of memory and cause the program to crash. And this is known as a stack overflow. Generally, therefore, recursion should be avoided. But there are situations where it is the best or sometimes the only way to solve a problem. A good example is tree traversal algorithms, which we look at in another video, or performing a flood fill in a graphics application. Having watched this video, you should be able to answer the following key questions. What is recursion? And when might you want to use recursion over iteration?